I guess, beloved, that like me, when you wake up in the morning, your dream goes straight out of the window. And it's a pity, really, because some of those dreams are pretty good. And then all of a sudden you wake up and they are gone. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'm actually singing a chorus. And that guarantees that Joyce will go out the window. Uh, you know, my singing is so bad. But the other day, I actually, for the first time, I actually woke up with a nursery rhyme. That shows you what stage of life I'm in, doesn't it? The grand old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. He marched them to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up or down. Didn't see anyone running out the door then. But if, it, it strikes me, beloved, that if, if Paul was writing the letter of Galatians, and if he had known this particular nursery rhyme, he might well have used it. Because he was writing to the Galatians about Galatians, you, you step over the line and you get in, but you're neither up or down. You, you, you know, you're, you've made the commitment, but, but so what? And beloved, it's so easy for us to do that as well as Christians. To step over the, the line of conversion. Yes, I've been converted, I gave my life to the Lord, da 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 But not move very far beyond that line of conversion neither up nor down. And we believe, but actually our lives often fail to fall short of what we believe and what they're meant to be. And we're neither up or down. And I think that Paul best summed it up when he said in verse, chapter 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, having begun with the Spirit, do you now revert back to the flesh? And we might think, well, that was the Galatians. What relevance is that to us? But let me ask you a question. Let me ask you this question. Are you as much in love with the Lord and are you as overflowing and as open with the Lord as you were when you first met him? Or has your first love grown cold in your Christian walk? Oh, foolish Galatians, having begun with the Spirit, do you now revert back to the flesh? And is that a question that we need to ask ourselves? Could, sorry, can you put up the things for me? Right, that's the first one. On to the second one now, I think. Right? Right. It's, it's so easy, says Paul, it's so easy for us to cool down. So how, how, do, I, how do I cope with this? How do I do this? How do I... Uh, put this right. And Paul's answer to this is threefold. It's, and it can be summarized up in these three words, all of them starting with a C, just to help us to remember them. Confess, contend, and continue. 1 John 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is righteous and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means, beloved, that we need to keep our account with God free from sin. It means that every time I sin, and I do, and you do too, every time I sin, I need to confess it. I need to put it, I need to bring it to, before the Lord. Because when I confess my sin, repentance means growth. If I want to grow in the Lord, I need to keep my account with the Lord free of sin. So repentance means to grow in God. And the second word that I have there is contend. Jude 3 says, I had, I had to write to you and urge you to contend for your faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. There's a battle going on, in case you didn't know, Lord, uh, if you, in case you didn't know, there's a battle going on within us between what is good and what is wrong. And as Christians, we are actively to be involved in this battle. Christians don't grow by just sitting back and drifting. We actually have to contend for our faith. We have to make choices in our faith. We don't grow as Christians doing nothing. We must contend. We must use our faith and we must grow in it. 
And then the third word up there is continue. John 8, 31 and 32. You are my disciples if you continue in my word and the word will set you free. You will know freedom. You, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So how do I, the question, how do I confess, contend and continue? <coughs> And the answer, says Paul, is found in the passage that we're looking at this morning. We've finally got there to in Galatians 5. We're looking at Galatians 5, verses 13 to 26. And it's entitled, Free to Do What is Right. We're going to look at this verse by verse, so you'll find it helpful to have your Bibles open. If you're using a church Bible, it's, um, it's uh, page 1172. Galatians 5, and we're looking at verses 13 to 26. In my Bible, it, this passage is entitled, Walking in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is mentioned seven times in this particular passage, so it's important. And the climax of this, verse 25, where Paul writes, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I'm doing it this way because I'm trying to encourage you to bring your own Bibles to church with you, all right? I'm trying to get you to bring Bibles to church. It's a good testimony. That's our theme for this morning. Can you change over for me, please? Right, that's, that's our theme for the, this morning. And how do I learn to walk and continue to walk in the Spirit? And Paul gives us four pointers, and again they start with a C. A clarification, a command, a contrast, and a call. So let's begin with a clarification. We're going to read verses 13 to 15, please, Claire. You, Did my you brothers... Next one on for me, sorry. Sorry. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Thank you. Throughout the book of Galatians, Paul is writing about the problem of legalism within the church. Legalism is the idea that somehow I have to earn my salvation. I have to do this in order to please God. That's, that's what um, legalization, uh, legalism is all about. Things I do that God loves me because I do this or I do that for him in his name. And the truth is, beloved, that God loves you just because Jesus lives in your life. God loves you just because Jesus lives in your life. It's as pure and as simple as that. It's got nothing to do with our actions. It's got nothing to do with, with our, our works. It's all because Jesus lives in my life. And there's nothing I can do to, learn, to earn God's love. God loves me. God loves you, full stop. And he loves you because of his son, Jesus. And it's this alone that sets us free. And Paul says, when you are free, don't go back on your freedom. Don't leave your freedom. When God sets you free, you are free indeed, full stop. And going back to last week's verse that we had and the beginning of this chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And legal, legalism is slavery. It's being enslaved to do things to please God. It's always trying to limit my experience of Christ, both personally and also as a church uh, as well. Trying to please God by doing it in my own strength and in my own power. And Paul says, don't lose the freedom that has been given to you. Don't go back into slavery. Don't lose that freedom. 
but at the same time don't abuse that freedom. And the danger is, beloved, that like the prosperity movement, we can say, oh, well, if Christ has set me free, then I'm, I'm free. I'm free of doing anything. I can do anything I like. I can do anything I like. And there's no condemnation in it. I'm, I'm free. I'm free. But Paul says, he said, this is not so. Don't use your freedom to gratify your flesh. What does that mean? It means that before I became a Christian, I had the old nature in me. It was easy for me to sin. I had no problem in doing it. But when I was converted, when Christ came into my life, he gave me a new nature. He gave me God's nature. He gave me God's Holy Spirit within my life. And now I have two natures in me. And they fight one another. I have the old nature that wants to do this. And I have the new nature that, that God has placed within me. And this battle, this battle goes on within each one of us. I have to contend. I have to choose to say no to my old nature. Not easy. And I have to choose to say yes to my new, new nature. And the more I want to walk God's chosen path, and we've been singing it today, the more I want to choose to walk God's path, the more hassle I'm going to have. So how do I do this? Well, says Paul in this passage, by putting others and their needs before my own. Verse 13 again, it says, serve one another in love. Jesus is an example of that, isn't he? Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve. And so, where do we get this question, what is the church doing for me? We should be asking, what am I doing for the church? The church doesn't do this, the church doesn't visit me, the church doesn't do this, da, 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 da. It's not, what is the church not doing for me? But what am I doing? How am I serving? How am I being Christ-like? How am I following my master the way that he's... He teaches me, serve one another in love, it says here. Which, that means it cuts out all criticisms, doesn't it? I'm serving in love. And I do this, beloved, not to earn brownie points, not to do it because I must, I do it because I love him. I do it because I want to be like him. But loving Jesus is the easy bit. Loving Jesus is people, that's a bit more difficult, isn't it? I mean, look around, don't all look at me at the same time, but <laughs> loving Jesus is the easy bit. But loving Jesus' people is the difficult bit. And the church in Galatia had the same problem that the church today has. Let me read it to you again, verse 15. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. We're talking about gossip. 2,000 years later, we still have the same problem that Galatia had. Gossip within the church. It's a cancer. They do it, we don't do it, do we? They do it, he does it, he gossips, he does it. Gossip within the church is a cancer, beloved. And the mark of the Spirit moving in the church is love. When you come into a church and you feel the love that is there, that is the moving of God's Spirit. It's easy to love Jesus. Not so easy to love Jesus' people. But that's what love is all about. And you can't love Christ without loving his people. So our relationship with others affects my relationship with God. Let me say that again. My relationship with others affects my relationship with God. So let me ask you this question. Is there a relationship, beloved, that you need to sort out today? Think about it. Is there a relationship? It may not be in the church, it may be at home, it may be at work, but is there a relationship that you need to sort out today? Because... Our relationship with God is affected by our relationship with others. Let's move on to the next one. 
a command. Right, let's, um, let's read verses 16 and 17, please. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. Thank you. Paul commands us to live by the Spirit because this is the only way that we can be free in the Spirit, truly free. And he's not ignorant of the battles that are going on in our lives. He, he knows that we have to face these battles day by day. And the word he uses here in verse 16, the word desire, means to yearn for, to deeply yearn, to have a passion for. And everything that is against me has a passion to destroy me. But I have a passion of his spirit within me to, to be Christ-like. There's a battle going on. We're in the middle of a civil war. And we need to realize it. And I have to contend. I have to learn to say no to that which does not honor God. As we choose for God rather than our old natures, we will find isolation. We will find that we have opposition. But praise God, he that is in us is greater than he that is against us. God's Spirit. So we have within us the, the Holy Spirit of God and he is there to help, to lead and to hold us. We read this in verse 18. Could you read that for us, please? But if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under law. We are free by God's Spirit. We are led, we are held, we are kept. And then, thirdly, we have a contrast. Can you put that one up for me, please? Verses 19 to 23, please. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Thank you. There's a contrast between the good and the evil here in this passage. And we are caught in the middle of it. Verses 19 to 21, I've written it up there, lists 15 different sins uh, here. The first three sins deal with sexual immorality. Sex outside the marriage of a husband and wife is sin. Full stop. No arguments. The second two sins mentioned here, idolatry and witchcraft, are sins because they try to control, they try to replace God. And the remaining sins there, we would call them uh, sins, social sins really, sins that can we can so easily be caught up in. Hatred, Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, fractions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and so on. It goes on and on and on. But beloved, the contrast is more than what we see here. The contrast is not only found in verses 22 and 23, but it's more especially should be seen in our lives. The world should be able to see the second list in our lives. This is what a Christian is all about. Let me read to you, let me read it to you again. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And I want us to notice with these two lists, beloved, that the first list deals with works. The second list deals with fruit. The first is the work of the flesh. The second is the fruit of the spirit. One is works, one is spirit. Works come from ourselves, fruit comes from the spirit within us. And that's 
how, how Christians are supposed to be seen. Although we battle with the old nature, God has put within us this new nature, these fruits of the Spirit. And we should be able to look around and say, yes, I see this fruit and that fruit and these fruits in you through God's Spirit. So let me quickly move on. Please, the next one, verses uh, 24 and to 26, which deal with the call. Could you read that for us, please? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Let me come back uh, just very quickly to verse 25 because as you will remember it's our verse for the year. Verse 25, since we live by the Spirit let us keep in step with the Spirit. And as it's our um, verse for the year let me just spend a moment or two uh, looking at this with you. How do we keep in step with the Spirit? And I want to suggest to you beloved that we keep in step step moment by moment day by day by being yielded to the spirit confessing our sin is not enough we need to be yielded to the spirit that means that my it involves my body my mind and i i must act upon anna um, brought it out in the children's story we're not to hear the word only but we're to act upon it we're to put it into action we must act upon it Yes, it will lead to separation. Yes, there will be people within my family, within my church, that will not like it because I'm serving God rather than serving the world. I'm choosing for God. And, and the world is naturally a godless place until it meets God. And so there will be conflict. There will be misunderstandings. But I am choosing to follow God. And we cannot revel in the sins of the world and at the same time walk in the spirit let me say that again we can't revel in the sins of the world we can't party in the sins of the world and at the same time walk in the spirit we have to choose and and yielding involves the renewing and the transformation of my thinking and my expectation i have to learn how to think god thoughts we've got to learn what is right and what is wrong and how to to deal with it it is a lifelong process that i am in that you are in and in that process we know god's peace keeping up keeping in step with the spirit it says here means that we are moving forward that the christian life is not one where we sit still but it's one where we move forward together this is a call to respond to God and this passage that we've been looking at this morning beloved is a call to allow God the freedom that he has already given us not to step back from the freedom that we have experienced but to allow the reality of that freedom in our lives I finish um, with a verse that uh, I came across the other day in my quiet time it says from Psalm 119 verse 45 I will walk in the freed in freedom for I have rooted I have rooted myself in your word I walk in freedom because I've rooted myself in your word how do we know freedom the answer is read his word the answer is pray the answer is to be more God conscious the answer is to put it into practice I came across a verse and it's uh, on the front of your, the new sheet. I asked him to put it on for us. James 4 verse 17 in the New Living Translation. It says, remember that it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's a challenge, isn't it? doesn't bring us under condemnation beloved it doesn't bring us under condemnation it points us to the grace and the wonder of God but his love his grace his wonder should motivate me 
to saying, I surrender, I surrender all. Lord, here I am. I've made a failure. I'm a failure in my own strength. I can't do it in my own strength, but here I am. You have set me free. Lord, help me to walk in that freedom. Let's pray. Father God, we, we realise just how inadequate we are, Lord. But Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, Lord, your word reminds us that you love us, that you love us, that you love us. And we pray that, Lord, we may have a hunger and a desire for so much more of your word, Lord. And Lord, not just to read it, not just to know it, not just to pray it, but actually to put it into practice. We thank you for that verse from James, Lord. If you know that it is sin and you don't do it, then it is sin. So Lord, help us to do what we ought to be doing, that you may be glorified in our lives. For Christ's sake. Amen. We're going to close.